Well, good morning. I'm King County Executive Dow Constantine. The surge in crude oil coming into Washington State on trains is staggering. From nearly zero in 2011 to tens of millions of gallons today. That oil is arriving on corridors that cross King County from north to south, from east to west. These rail lines travel through and under major population centers, alongside CenturyLink and Safeco Fields, and beneath downtown Seattle, and under the Magnolia Bridge, as we saw just a few weeks ago. These rail lines are frequently blocked by landslides. At present, up to 13 times a week, these oil, uh, these oil trains carry upwards of 1 million gallons of volatile oil through our communities. Bakken oil from North Dakota is particularly explosive. This is a new and significant risk for our people, our economy, and our environment. Oil train derailments, spills, fires, have already resulted in evacuations, devastating pollution, and loss of life across the United States and Canada. In Alabama, 30,000 barrels of crude oil spilled into a marshland. In downtown Lynchburg, Virginia, three train cars tumbled into the James River, one catching fire. In rural Alberta, a pair of tanker explosions forced two waves of evacuation in the middle of the night. And in a town in Quebec, a runaway oil train triggered explosions that killed 47 people and leveled half of a downtown. We must be prepared here in King County for the immediate risk of highly flammable crude oil in aging oil tank cars. That's why I had our Office of Emergency Management conduct the region's first ever tabletop exercise specifically designed for oil train disasters. I spent some time at the exercise to personally uh, thank our local responders and emergency managers for, from local, state, and federal governments. To check their readiness and their communication, they ran through this scenario, that an oil train derailed and exploded uh, near I-5 and Martin Luther King Way, just near Boeing Field, in the middle of the workday. Every disaster scenario has its moving parts. Uh, if an oil tanker exploded, the first fire trucks on the scene would have to assess the situation. Will their flame retardant foam be enough to extinguish the flames? Is the fire too hot to approach? Do they have to pull back and let the oil burn itself out, as happened in Alberta? And if the oil had to be allowed to burn, would it burn for several hours? That might present another set of questions. For public health, would the toxic cloud from the burning oil float over downtown Seattle or some other nearby community? Are there nearby homes, restaurants, schools, or senior centers that would have to be evacuated? On transportation, if people are evacuated, do we have enough buses and bus drivers to get people out? Can we get more buses and drivers from other agencies or school districts or from other counties? Are access roads even open? And on communications, how do we get the evacuation order out to the public? Uh, not just through traditional media, like you, but through social media or even face-to-face -face knocking on doors. These are the kinds of things that were discussed yesterday. And afterward, I, th I think it's fair to say our first responders saw that an oil tanker fire would not just be another big fire, that it would require a massive response. So that's the bottom line. Are we ready? Well, as a result of this exercise, our emergency managers say we are as ready as any county in the nation can be for the threat of an oil tanker explosion and fire. But it should not have to come to that. As an elected leader, it is my job to protect the public from these kinds of risks. That's why uh, last month I brought together more than 50 elected leaders from across the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia. And we have, we are proud to let you know that henceforth our group of leaders will be known as the Safe Energy Leadership Alliance. Our shared mission is to better understand the potential safety and economic impacts from coal and oil trains and to be able to speak with a unified voice. 
we will be more successful at addressing those issues and better at preventing problems if we work together as a region. If all the newly proposed oil by rail projects across Washington are built, nearly as much crude oil would be transported through Washington and Oregon by train as would flow through the proposed Keystone Pipeline. This increase in oil trains will impact our local economy, crowding out rail capacity for moving Washington-grown crops and Washington-built products for shipment to uh, overseas markets. Wheat farmers in our state are, in fact, already having a harder time transporting the crop, which impacts both our economy and our food supply. And crowded rail lines also mean more congestion for commuters here in the heart of urban metropolitan King County. And that is not to mention the impact that the burning of crude oil has on our environment and on the acceleration of climate change. The transition to cleaner, safer energy is happening right now. And I'm committed to making King County a leader in that transition. Now, getting back to the tabletop exercise, I want to thank Walt Hubbard, my emergency management director, for organizing yesterday's exercise. And we are also joined today by Chief Mark Chubb of King County Fire District Number 20 on behalf of all the first responders who participated. And Chief Chubb will be here to answer questions. But first, I'd like to turn it over to Walt. We had a very good session yesterday, and it was important for us to bring the different key, key uh, players who are going to be impacted um, by an oil train event that described by, as described by our executive. It was nice to be able to see Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Burlington Northern, also first responders in the Rome Health Department, and a number of other jurisdictions within King County who are very much interested in trying to figure out how do we communicate, how do we understand what the impact and the, and the risks are, and then how will we respond. So I, I was really uh, appreciative of being able to provide a framework in which to have this conversation and also very appreciative of all of the key players in the room being very candid about their concerns. I think a couple things resonated for everyone yesterday. We need, to, we need to do a better job of getting information from the point of event to the public. And as all of you know, you are very important in that process. Uh, it also is very important that the type of message that we give to the public is something that they would understand and something they re can react to, especially in an involving situation. And I think the, the other pieces that came out that, that uh, resonated with everyone yesterday is the need for us to use every single communication tool that we may have available. And that includes, as the executive had mentioned, social media uh, and tapping those uh, community organizations who can best communicate and get information out in the, in the community. So once again, it was about coordinating and providing direct support to the first responders who are going to be there, and, and that's part of our mission. The other part of our support here is how do we get the information pulled together quickly as the, as the event evolves to be able to give the public some current information to make sure that they are safe, because that is our primary mission. Great. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure there are a number of questions. I just wanted to reemphasize that this is a new We've always obviously had shipment of oil, but now uh, we suddenly have this very volatile oil coming through in large quantities on our rail lines. This is not something that happened even five years ago. So that's why the urgency of uh, addressing the potential for an explosion, particularly in a populated area. And uh, I have to say that um, my colleagues from around the Northwest uh, who assembled previously uh, because of their concern about the coal trains that were coming through the communities uh, at our meeting uh, with our Safe Energy Leadership Alliance uh, really raised um, urgent concerns about the oil trains as well and wanted to add that to the mission of the organization, which is why the name has expanded to include both oil and coal trains. So, questions? Are you, um, have you taken into consideration the train manufacturers and the train companies uh, about the new technologies in train car development and safety? And have you, has that been addressed? 
Uh, there is an urgent concern about the old style uh, tanker cars continuing to be used. These are particularly prone to, um, to problems. They, they're not as safe as the newest technology. The federal government has announced a rulemaking process around these issues, but that is going to take years to play itself out. We are calling on the federal government to prohibit the use of the old style, most dangerous tanker cars until there is a solution through that rulemaking process. Were you satisfied with uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe's participation in the exercise? Uh, for the portion I was there, I thought that they did a very good job. They were um, forthright and factual. And I guess I'll let Walt reflect on uh, on the balance of the meeting yesterday, I can I can just reinforce that. It, you know, it would have been very it would have been very easy for Burlington Northern to be seen as the sort of uh, bad guy in the room. They were very transparent yesterday. They were very cooperative. I think that helped the conversation because there were a number of questions about their ability to respond, their the resources and capacity. So I thought they took a really proactive uh, position yesterday and wanted to make sure that they demonstrated that they wanted to work with us as partners. It was important for us to have them in the room. We were glad that they were there. Did they disclose to you the quantities of oil coming through at different times of days and kind of what their schedules are? Um, or was there certain information that they refused to um, give to you? There was no question that they didn't want to answer yesterday and they did provide us information with respect to the speed that trains may be coming through during certain portions of, especially the larger urban areas. Uh, they talked to us a bit, a bit about capacity, but there wasn't a question that they weren't, they, they were willing to answer every question yesterday. And what did you think of the response to the derailment under the Magnolia Bridge uh, recently? How, how did that go and was that instructive at all? I, well, I, I, th I got that question asked yesterday and I think it was and once again a reinforced how important this is for us to be able to bring our key players together to figure out how we're gonna address this. So it was more of an attention getter for us. Other questions? Are you, with, with increased capacity, obviously we know everything about roads here, is the infrastructure uh, capable of handling these type of loads and speeds and the amount of uh, capacity? Well, uh, if you're talking about the rail infrastructure, we know that there is a capacity problem. Uh, the addition of these coal trains and oil trains will severely tax the ability of the railroads to carry the kind of uh, value-added products that are created here in our state. And it's a concern already for farmers in uh, Montana. Uh, we heard about that at the last meeting of our uh, Safe Energy Leadership Alliance. And in Washington State, in fact, and it is going to get worse. There is only so much capacity. And a lot of our economy has been built on the notion that we can bring products from overseas, ship them inland, and then ship our products out on the um, returning cars. But if those trains are instead uh, stacked with uh, oil tankers or laden with coal, we're not able to ship wheat and apples. Uh, it simply is, a, is an issue of capacity. So that's an economic problem, but there's another economic problem which has to do with the way in which this additional rail traffic ties up our own roads. Uh, we already have, obviously, tremendous traffic problems. And the many, many um, rail crossings where trains are competing with commuter traffic uh, are places where our local economy is going to be hurt by this traffic. It's going to cause people to be late to work, cause goods not to be able to be shipped properly. And it is a drag on the, um, the real economic engine of our state, which is our local manufacturing and technology uh, sector here in Central Puget Sound. So obviously this is a significant concern for you. Other than holding exercises like this and lobbying the federal government, is there really anything more you can do as a county executive? So this gets, this is a very important point. You know, we first of all are in charge collectively of emergency management. So our job is to prepare for what may come based on, but I also feel that it's my job to try to change those circumstances to prevent it from happening. Local governments do not have authority over railroads. That is a federal authority. Collectively, we in the Safe Energy Leadership Alliance want to join our voices together to demand action from our federal government. Congress has within its power has it within its power 
to regulate these dangerous shipments. They have it within their power to make sure that there's capacity in the railway for the goods being produced by manufacturers and farmers in our state and across the Pacific Northwest. That is something that we want from our members of Congress, and I think this is a challenge for other regions of the country as well, and I hope that their members of Congress will respond. In your study of the uh, issues yesterday, um, are there any particular points where there's uh, exaggerated risk of uh, derailment um, on the rail line? Do you want to talk about this? And by exaggerated, you mean more, more greater, risk. greater risk, yeah, not sorry. that somebody's <laughs> exaggerating. Yeah. Um, I, I don't. I wasn't there for that part. Yeah, that, that issue did not come up. The issue came up with regard to what what would be the differences going through highly dense density urban areas and also in the rural areas within King County. We, we just didn't get into that particular piece yesterday with the exception of that. But are there places along the rail line where, where that is an issue, where the trains are going at higher from, speeds or? From an from emergency management point of view, we're looking at the density of, of where they travel through, um, which is much, much more of a concern for us than others, not that the rural areas are not. Um, but we didn't talk about the, the quality or the, the strength of the, of the track areas coming through King County. That did not come up yesterday as a conversation. Would you guys suggest that um, local agencies uh, have more control over uh, the, the, the rail lines in certain communities, counties, and take it away from the federal because? Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's a purely theoretical question because yeah. I doubt very much the federal government is going to cede authority over rail shipments to local governments. But logically, yes, of course, we're charged with this, you know, protecting the safety of our people we should have some ability to control what's being brought through our communities. We should have notice, at least, time of day, um, and even more than that, I think, uh, we should be able to hold the shippers to a high standard uh, of safety. We have none of that authority. So what we do have is um, the ability to join together and to articulate the challenge that we're facing and demand action from our government. And uh, if that's the one tool we have, we're going to use it. I think it, um, it would be interesting to hear from the perspective of the folks who are going to be called upon to deal with an emergency when it happens, uh, what, how they view this emerging threat. And so this is uh, Chief Mark Chubb of Fire District 20, and I was hoping you could share a little bit about what the, uh, what the first responders heard out of yesterday's exercise. Thank you, Executive Constantine. I think it's uh, safe to say that the fire service has been uh, very attentive to the risk uh, of oil transshipment by rail, uh, especially since the incident in Montreal, uh, or outside Montreal in Quebec um, several months ago. Um, we obviously are very organized with uh, our peers across the country and share lessons freely about risks like this, highly technological risks that are uh, rare events. And uh, we have worked, uh, as uh, Executive Constantine has pointed out, with partners across the country to um, make our concerns about uh, rail transshipment uh, known to the federal government through its rulemaking process. Um, this is an area that um, is well known to firefighters. Uh, train derailments uh, occur across the country with some frequency. Uh, I myself have been to four of them. <laughs> in uh, a, a career a little over 40, a uh, little over 30 years. Um, they are challenging events, uh, but King County is as well or better prepared than any other county in the nation because of the existing automatic and mutual aid agreements we have in place and the frequency with which we interoperate across borders. Uh, King County jurisdictions uh, operate uh, routinely with two, three, four, or even five jurisdictions participating in even the most routine events. So we have a high degree of interoperability and a high degree of familiarity with each other's procedures and equipment. And I think yesterday's practice reinforced that, uh, especially with regard to horizontal coordination across jurisdictional lines. And uh, as we saw yesterday, there's always room for improvement in that vertical coordination, being able to bring uh, the needs that we have in an escalating incident uh, to the attention of the county and to mobilize resources across county lines or even potentially state lines and to secure assistance from the federal government. Chief, can you describe uh, particularly the type of equipment that might be particularly needed for something like this? Do you have enough of it in the right places? You know, that kind of thing, the strategy one might use in, a, in an oil train disaster. 
Certainly. Uh, specialized equipment is required to suppress fires involving uh, volatile organic chemicals, uh, crude oil. Uh, we would need qu uh, significant quantities of uh, foam. Uh, that resource is in somewhat short supply. Um, we wouldn't probably try to completely suppress the fire with foam. Uh, the volumes required to manage uh, even a smaller uh, fire incident involving foam would be almost prohibitive. We do have networks for securing that foam on short notice to reinforce the existing caches that are strategically located throughout the county. Um, but we would most likely use them to protect life uh, and to minimize exposures to other property or to prevent the escalation of the incident through further failure of a tank car rather than pro trying to suppress the incident completely. So in terms of it being in short supply, I mean, is that a concern? Do you feel that now we need to ramp up the supply after this? No. Uh, we have arrangements in place, particularly with the commercial sector. Uh, the railroads maintain a supply. Uh, refiners and shippers maintain a supply, the fire agencies maintain a supply, and we have agreements in place with uh, the military and with the Port of Seattle to mobilize the supplies that they have for aviation accidents. So we have access to ample initial response capability. After, after this exercise, are you, are you still comfortable with the idea of trains carrying petroleum crude oil or other flammable uh, liquids passing through major cities like Seattle? Uh, they always have and they probably always will. Um, the issue here isn't the speed with which they travel or uh, the quantity they carry, it's the frequency. Uh, there are about 228,000 rail tank cars in service in the United States uh, and until recently most of them were laying idle. Uh, today uh, there's a shortage of tank cars. So uh, as the executive noted, most of those are of an older design. Uh, many improvements are needed to bring them up to a contemporary safety standard. I think the, the concern to us is that any time you increase the volume or frequency of something, you obviously increase the risk even if it's already very low. Uh, the speeds that the trains travel through the metropolitan area, the most populated and, and vulnerable area, is, is speed regulated already by the railroads. And I think uh, we, we received uh, significant assurances yesterday from the railroads that uh, they observe those limits within the urban area. What is the speed limit through Seattle, do you know? Uh, it varies. Uh, most of the most highly uh, populated areas, the speed limit uh, that we were advised yesterday was about 25 miles an hour. Uh, and as you'll see if you watch the corridor near uh, Safeco, it's, it's usually much slower than that because of the volume of commuter rail traffic. There's a large uh, Vancouver uh, oil terminal proposed for Vancouver, Washington, um, and a lot of this oil traffic would be presumably routed to that terminal, uh, potentially for export overseas. That's a decision that um, Governor Inslee is ultimately going to make, as I understand it, uh, whether to approve that facility. Does the Safe Energy Leadership Alliance have a position on that, or do you, are you, do you have a position on whether would, that thing should be built? We Well, my personal position would be that it should not. Um, the Safe Energy Leadership Alliance, in fact, has uh, membership from British Columbia, including a council member from Vancouver, uh, who is very, very concerned about the impacts on her constituents uh, of both coal and oil shipments. Uh, I think that, you know, our alliance is a forum for people to exchange information. If there's an opportunity to have a joint position, we'll articulate it. Otherwise, there may be subgroups uh, of this, uh, this organization who can join together to advocate for a position, and this might be one of those. And also, are you going to be doing any outreach um, ahead of a disaster to inform people about the risks mm -hmm. in places like, I don't know, Golden Gardens, where the trains go right past the park or near the stadiums? Yeah, you know, a bedrock and a, and a foundation of our work has always been personal preparedness. So we've been working, in, and also through the initiative that the executive has introduced King County in terms of whole community. We're looking at, look, at looking at those communities that we may not have outreached before and also those who may be in more of a vulnerable situation than they have been before. So personal preparedness is something we're going to continue to push. What, what would that, uh, thank you very much. We'll, we'll uh, just uh, tap one or one. And we'll catch you up one or one. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for being here today.